we're here to talk about Qt. Uh, this is Qt in depth. This is not really a, something you can take, the information I'm going to give you, it's not something you can take and go back and write a better program with. I'm just going to talk about the internals, how we actually implement the, these specific parts of Qt. I'm going to talk about something called Pimple, how we implement private implementation, how we use private implementation inside of Qt. Implicit sharing, this is our copy on write mechanism. We talk about the atomic API that we added to Qt 4, how we use that. I have a couple of examples of, uh, of code that I just copy and pasted straight out of Qt 4 too. We're going to look at them. We're going to talk a little bit about QObject, uh, mostly uh, some of the, the more interesting parts of QObject. I'm not going to talk about things like the parent pointer in QObject. That's kind of obvious how that works. Of course, signals and slots, everybody likes to hear about that, so we're going to talk about that uh, towards the end of the presentation. And then I'd like to share some of the pains that we go through to, to support the different compilers that we support, um, and some of the pains uh, of the compilers that we don't support anymore. So, to start off, we're talking about Pimple. Pimple, I love that word, short for private implementation. This is a uh, a pattern that you use when uh, implementing library or framework style software. What it means is you 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 have an interface to a, or you have a class like QString, QObject, all of the things that you see in our public API. Those are an interface to the private implementation inside of Qt. This is how the piece the the private the real implementation of Qt. The public classes are just a wrapper around those. We, we use this everywhere throughout Qt, with a few exceptions, things like QColor and QModelIndex. For some reason or another, they store their data in the public class, just in private access. Why? Couldn't tell you. Don't know. But they do it. They're fairly simple classes. They don't have any kind of, uh, they, they mostly store integers and, and, uh, and various numbers and these types of things. So. Maybe that's why we don't do it. I don't know. The reason we do this, we, we try to guarantee binary compatibility between releases. What this means is that um, if we were to put data members into our classes, into our public classes, if we were to add a member or remove a member, we're changing the size, we're changing the layout of the data in that object, which means if I was to give you a new release, you compile Qt and then run your program against that library, it would break spectacularly it would break. I can promise you that because we've changed the binary representation of the classes in Qt. So we use private implementation. We put all of the data that we need to implement QWidget and QString and QList and these types of things into a, a class that you don't see. We hide this inside of our implementation because we need to have a way to extend these classes in the future. We want to be able to add features. We want to be able to add new things to our classes. We want to be able to fix bugs and remove bad things, replace them with good things. We do this all the time, right? We can do this because of private implementation. The way we do it is by storing a single pointer inside of our classes. Um, we affectionately call this the D pointer. It's been called this for years, long before I ever started at Trolltech. We call it the D pointer. Everything that we, when we refer to private implementation is the D pointer, right? All of our private classes are the D pointer, right? Oh, the, uh, whenever I implement a QString, I have to first get the length from the D pointer, or I have to, when I append a character, I need to be sure and I have to write the data in the D pointer. That's the name of the classes. All of the data and, and functions and such things that we add to them, right? We, we, oh, we can put that in the D pointer. Or we, we, you know, let's do, I need a new slot. Well, you'll have to put that in the D pointer. And of course, uh, recently we've also put, started putting all of our platform specific implementations into the private. We don't clutter up the public API with, with details like, um, like, uh, how we implement the event processing on Windows or how we do the, um, how we do the, the drag and drop implementation on on X, on X11. All that stuff is in the D pointer. 
what this means is every public class has a private counterpart. We call them, for the most part, Q object private for Q object, Q widget private for Q widget, Q TCP socket as Q TCP socket private, Q item model as Q item model private. Just the pattern that we use. Most of these private symbols are not exported because they're not actually visible uh, and you can't link them or use them from your applications. We, we hide those all, uh, away from you, for better or for worse. This pattern is, uh, uh, we're going to talk about a little bit with QObject, how we actually use private implementation in QObject. We do some very clever tricks here. But, uh, I wanted to talk mostly about how our value-based classes are implemented and how we use Pimple together with other tricks to, 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 to give you what you know today is QStream, QList, QVector, QMap, uh, and these types of classes. The tool classes are, are a bit special because unlike QObject and QWidget, many of the functions that we implement are inline, meaning we have to have the data, the private, the D pointer visible in the public header so that we can implement these functions inline. What this means is that um, we, put, we have to put that data in private access and all, all the inline functions access that private data. This is a bit special, something I didn't put on the slide here. It's a bit special because what this means is because we access all that data inline, we can't actually change that data. It's all inline. Whenever you inline the code, the compiler generates offsets to the data. Even though it's private access, the inline functions still have a fixed offset where they expect to find the data, so we can't actually change these either. So, but the reason we do this is because it lets us do implicit sharing. By combining, by using implicit sharing, we can add a reference count to, to our classes. This is the next thing we're going to talk about. Implicit sharing is the name we have given the copy on write mechanism. Everybody familiar with copy on write? Yeah. Who's not heard of copy on write? Okay. Copy on write. What this means is that I've got a piece of data that I want to represent in a public class. What this means is that the public class has a piece of, uh, right, a private class that it uses to, to hold the data. Whenever I have an instance, uh, it will point to a piece of this data. If I make a copy, I try to make copies, right, all of them will point to the same copy of the data. They're all separate instances, they're separate classes are separate instances of this class, but they all point to the same data. But now, if you try to modify one of these instances, that will create a copy that is unique to that instance and the modification we made there. Everybody else will still continue to share this piece of data, and the modification will be given to somebody else, right? He gets a copy of the data. He's going to make the modification. All of us, we still use the same shared copy. That's copy on write. Implicit sharing is the name we've given it. Again, we use this in all of our value-based classes. QString, QList, QVector, QPen, QBrush, QColor, QModelIndex. They don't because we don't use private implementation of those. So there are always exceptions, right? As I said, all we do, we add a reference count to the data. We, As we add make copies, we just add to the reference count. And as we make modifications or destroy these copies, the reference count goes down. When it goes to zero, we simply delete the data. One optimization that we do with implicit sharing is something called the shared null. Whenever you default construct something or clear something like a Q string, we need a way to represent an empty string or an empty list. We use the shared null to do this. The shared null is a static instance of that private data. That data is POD, plain old data. It does not have a constructor, does not have a destructor. We initialize the reference count to one, meaning that we're always going to keep it positive. It will never go to zero. We'll never try to delete it. So 
what this means is we don't have to allocate data for to represent nothing. We can use the shared null. The shared null represents nothing. And we don't have to check for D to be zero. D is always going to be something valid because it's either going to point to a real piece of data or it's going to point to the shared null. Here's an example, copied straight out of cube 42 There are more classes that we do this in. I just had the space to show these. Cube array, cube list, cube string, cube vector. They all use this shared null optimization. The constructors and the destructors of all of these classes are implemented in line. They all look the same. The D pointer is initialized to something. In this case, this is the default constructor. We initialize it to the shared null and we increment the reference count. In the destructor, we decrement the reference count. This function will return, uh, the deref function will return false when the count goes to zero, which means we need to free the data when we're done. But uh, I'm sure there's questions brewing already. Qatomic init, what is that? Or this ref.ref, ref.deref, what is that? That is, uh, our atomic API. Copy on write because of the way it works. If you have multiple threads trying to do reference counting, especially on the shared null, the reference count can be can be stale. Right? We have a thread. You guys are going to increment the reference count of of the shared null. So you read the value. The value is one. When these guys do the same thing, they read the value. The value is one. You say, you add one to one, you get two. They do the same thing. And you both store back two. Value really should be three. So copy and write is inherently not thread safe. We have to do something to protect that reference count, to make sure that that reference count is always the right value so that we don't get into situations where you're working on a value that he's also working on. You need to be able to increment that value in an uninterruptible uh, uh, operation. This is what our internal atomic API gives us. We have two classes, two ba Q basic atomic and Q atomic. There's another question, why two? Well, as I mentioned, we need one to be POD. We need one to not have a constructor. We have this Q atomic init macro, which uses uh, the struct uh, initializer list so that we can initialize this data and have it ready with the correct values once the operating system loads the library into memory. The, all of those values will be stored in the binary. When the library is loaded, they have the correct values. There's no need to construct them, which means the minute I start executing multiple threads, the value is already there. It doesn't need to be initialized. I don't have to worry about preventing threads from coming in and touching my reference count before I've initialized it. It's already initialized. Qatomic is the convenient one. It's the one that adds the constructor so that I, in cases where I don't want to have to use this Qatomic init macro everywhere, I just use Qatomic to give me a nice constructor. Qatomic has a very limited API. There's, we've added just the things that we've needed to implement our reference counting, ref and deref. This is the atomic, right, uninterruptible increment and uninterruptible decrement. Whenever, you, whenever we start to increment, that increment will finish and we will write our new value back before anybody else can come and try to do the same thing. These, value, the, these functions, because of the, the way the various architectures that Qt supports, the way that these architectures work is some of them uh, cannot tell me the previous value before I did the increment. They can only tell me if the new value is zero or not. So these functions, because of that, only return true if the new value is non-zero, false if the new value is zero. Right? Very limited API. We only need that much information. We only need to know if the new value is zero or not so that we know when to delete data. So this suffices for us. Right? We use this to do our reference counting. Is that yes. If the value happens to be negative one, and you ref, it will go to zero, it will return false. Normally, we don't use that 
in the reference counting. We don't rely on the return value of ref in the reference counting, but it's there because uh, I can use it in the future. So I don't yet, but uh, I have some plans on how I can do it. So um, Qatomic also has a test and set, right? Test and set means I take a uh, an expected value, compare it to my Qatomic. If they match, I want to set a new value. If they don't, test and set will return false, meaning the values didn't match. I have three versions of test and set in Qt. I have a normal test and set, which simply just does the test and set as I've described. I have a, uh, two other versions with different semantics. These control how the CPU and the memory architecture in, the, in, in, in your system will order things that happen before and after the test and set. Acquire semantics is, uh, we use acquire semantics when we want to implement something like Qmutex. We're gonna see how I implement Qmutex here in just a second. Acquire semantics means whenever I do the test and set, the CPU is not allowed to reorder any uh, loads or stores to be after the test and set. Anything that was done before has to complete, can't be reordered by the system to be after the test and set. Normally this can happen. PowerPC uh, uh, um, and many other risk-based architectures, Spark, MIPS, Alpha, these types of systems, they have very advanced memory management units that allow both the CPU to change the execution order of your code and to change the order of the memory accesses that your code does. The acquire semantic prevents that. It creates effectively what's called a memory barrier, meaning at this point in time, anything that was happened before has to actually complete. You cannot reorder it until once it completes, then everything after has to complete. We, uh, we have two versions of this. One is the, I'm acquiring some sort of semaphore, some sort of lock. The other version is to release. They both do effectively the same thing. Q atomic also has exchange and swap. So I can atomically swap a variable in memory with a new value. Uh, this is very useful. I do this quite a bit uh, in, in, in a lot of the, the Q string, Q, uh, the tulip classes, Q string, Q list, Q vector. Uh, because I don't need the test and set, I just need to swap something. I don't care what the previous value was. I just need to put a new value in and get the old one back. And then I have some basic comparison. These are non-atomic comparisons, equality and inequality. I want to check at some point in time is a reference is this a known value that I'm not going to do swaps or sets or increments or decrements. I just want to know what the value is. I can do that with some of these basic comparison operators. I have another class, a template class called Qatomic Pointer. Depends on the CPU architecture. Most of these, most of these will will execute in one memory clock cycle. That's how most of them are defined. So, not CPU cycle, memory clock cycle. So, CPUs today run at two, three gigahertz, but memory is running at four, five, six hundred megahertz, right? Those, most of those will execute in one memory clock, not CPU clocks. So they all take about the same amount of time, but they're much slower than normal operations. This is the reason we use the Atomic API. All of the implementations of Qatomic, Qatomic pointer included, they are MP safe, meaning in a multi-CPU environment, these things happen uh, atomically. The, the, the change is made in, in one operation. The CPU uh, can't get into a stale state where it, it reads an intermediate or an, uh, uh, an old value. If I increment a value on one CPU, the, the second CPU will see that value immediately. That's the whole point of this atomic API. As I mentioned, Qatomic pointer, this is a template class. This is for typed pointers. Uh, we have test and set, no acquire and release, just the normal one, and uh, the swap, the exchange. We use this 
to implement uh, uh, some of the classes that we provide in our public API, right? Because I can, I can hear a question brewing. Hey, that sounds cool. Can I use it? Indirectly, yes. We have uh, classes called QShared and Q, Q -shared Data and QShared Data Pointer. You can use these classes to implement your own atomically reference counted value based type. If you uh, inherit from QShared Data, it has the reference count included in it. QShared Data Pointer will operate, will uh, manage the, the reference count for you. And all you have to do is implement a copy constructor and a destructor for your data. That's how you use these classes. The reason we do this uh, is because, I'm going to turn the slide off for a second so I can stand in front. The reason we do this is because of, because of the way we implement QAtomic on certain types of architectures. Spark, 32-bit, we have to reserve an extra 32 bytes in the QAtomic structure so that we can synchronize the real value of what we're wanting to implement using an extra semaphore inside of QAtomic. Uh, Q PA risk, has anybody ever done work on PA risk, the HP architecture? You have. Have you done assembly? No. Lucky guy. Um, the HP PA risk architecture has one atomic instruction. Things like PowerPC, Intel, these types of things, they allow you to have lots of different types of atomic operations, not just the ones that I've shown here. Uh, HPPA has one atomic instruction. This is a load clear word. What this means is I'm going to load something out of memory into a register, and I'm going to write zero into the location. Right? Load clear. This has to be 32 byte aligned, has to be cache line aligned, which means our implementation of QAtomic on HPPA risk is padded to 32 bytes, and we have to find the correctly aligned one inside of that padding. So. Um, if I can fix that type of thing, I might be able to put QAtomic and QBasic Atomic into the public API so that other people can use it. But uh, at the moment, I, I don't want to be locked to that implementation at the moment. I want to see if I can find a better way of doing it. Because um, that's just a very, st yeah, HPPA is, is a very strange one. Very strange one. The great thing about uh, architectures like PowerPC, uh, Alpha, MIPS, and, and some others that are based on the same type of family, they allow you to define any atomic operation, not just the ones that are predefined, like on Intel. So it, they're actually kind of, kind, kind of nice, but I don't think we'll ever be able to express that in, in an API like what we have. So just a little bit of knowledge. Um, in addition to atomic reference counting, like I mentioned, we actually use We've used the Atomic API to implement QMutex. The reason we do this is because, um, um, I don't know, how many of you heard my threading talk in the room, just as, uh, the previous one? Okay, several of you. Uh, you uh, uh, and you'll remember I talked about the rationale that we have behind a lot of the design decisions we make in Qt. Our goal is to promote concurrency not thread safety. Thread safety means for any given object that I want to modify, thread safety means I can allow anybody to come up and modify that, but I have to serialize the access to it, right? I have to make sure that somebody doesn't try to, two people don't, don't try to drink from the bottle at the same time, right? I have to protect that thread safety, right? I have to protect it against concurrent access. Our goal is reentrancy. Reentrancy means I would have many Coke bottles. I could give one to everybody. That means we could all drink more Coke in the same amount of time than if we were to try to drink one bottle at a time. Right? Everybody had to come up and just get one bottle at a time. If I give one bottle to everybody, we could all do more in the same amount of time. The rationale behind doing this um, um, means as these multi-core CPUs become more and more available, uh, we'll be able to do more and more work. So, back to QMutex. 
locked overhead is, is very high. Whenever you want to serialize access to something, lock overhead is very high, especially when you use the operating system primitives. They have to add in support for thread priorities, and uh, they have to implement something called fairness. We're going to talk about that here in just a second as well. We have to make sure that threads get access in the defined order, right? We don't want people cutting in line to get their drink of Coke, right? This is all overhead. And in a concurrent system, whenever you get a lock, a lot of times that lock will be uncontended, meaning nobody else but me is trying to get the lock. So why have the overhead? We can circumvent the overhead by using an atomic instruction. One memory clock instead of a system call that has to go deep into the kernel, and the kernel has to make lots of scheduling decisions and these types of things. So we can use this uh, in, a, in a way that um, that uh, it's, it, we don't we don't completely replace the operating system primitive. We just kind of bypass it very quickly. Benoit calls this the Benefor. Um, I call it the Trollifor. This is a little smarter than what they had in BOS. So, how do we do it? Qmutex, what we do, like I said, we check. We do a test and set with the acquire semantic to see, does anybody else have the lock? Or is anybody else waiting for the lock? And if there is, then I'll go and wait for the lock as well. I'll incur the overhead because that means, right, we, we, we want the overhead. We know we're doing serialization. And then we come back to this fairness problem, right? Well, if, if, if I do this, right, if I check the lock and I go stand at the back of the line, what's going to stop somebody from coming up and getting a drink before I do? That's not fair. Well, that is a problem, but we can solve that problem. I'm going to show you how. This is Qmutex lock. This is copied directly out of Q42. I've not changed anything except the indentation. I would uh, uh, to, I format it a little bit to, so that we can get everything on screen. But this is unmodified, taken directly out of Q42, right? I want to try something. Can I get some volunteers? No? OK. Maybe? OK. One volunteer is good enough. Sure, come on up here. Right, Qmutex lock. I'm going to write down a couple of numbers. Qmutex lock uses a value in the D pointer called D lock. Right, gotta love the D pointer. This is a Q atomic, represents an integer. So these guys are going to come in here and try to get the lock, right? So the first one that gets in is going to take the current value of D lock, which is zero. He's going to take this and try to increment it to one, right? So the first guy that came up, he now has the value of zero in the Sentinel, and I now have the value of one, sorry, in D lock. The other guy comes in and tries to do the same thing. He gets the value one and then writes the value of two into D lock. So now, these guys have got a number, right? If anybody's been to Norway, they know how this works. You go in, you push a button, and you get a number. You have to wait for that number to be called before you can go in and do whatever it is you want to do. Doesn't matter if you're going to the pharmacy or the post office or the police station or wherever, right? This is what we've done. We, you get the previous value of the lock whenever you came in to, and came in to, to get the lock, right? This number now indicates the number of threads that I've got waiting to get the lock, right? So let's continue. In your case, you're executing this code. What is your number? Zero. That's not zero. So we skip all the way out. So the lock is now yours. This self variable is something we get from the platform that indic indicates the thread ID. So you've got the lock. You're now the owner. We have come into the count. You've locked it one time. Congratulations, you've got the lock. Let's go back. Your value, what is your value? One. 
that's not zero, so we need to go in and check a few things first. Qmutex supports recursive locking, meaning if uh, he was to lock the thread again, he could get it if we were using a recursive lock. If he wasn't, I have code here to detect the deadlock and tell the programmer, sorry, you, you've locked one too many times, don't do that. Okay? But we didn't do that, so we're going to skip this part of the code. So the first thing you'd right, you didn't get the lock. You have to wait for it. So you wait. Sit down. Sorry. That's just the way it is. Okay? You're going to do whatever it is you're going to do. Right? You've got the lock. Now you're going to unlock. What are you going to do? Well, yeah, first we have to do, we say, how many locks do you have? You only have one. So it now goes to zero. We're going to set, you're, you're no longer the owner. We're going to test and set the lock. Is it one? No, it's not. So what do we do? We're going to wake him up. Right? So now if somebody else was to come in to try and grab the lock, what's going to happen? Can he steal it? No. This is not zero. We've solved the fairness problem. What's going to happen now is he's going to return from wait. Now has the lock. He's going to decrement the lock. Give me back the number. We now have one. He's going to go off and do whatever it is he wants to do. And then now, when he releases the lock, this value is one. We can set it back to zero. And the lock is free. Right? Thank you, guys. You can sit down now. Right? Thank you. Right? We only release the lock if there are no waiting threads, if there are no contenders. So if there are contenders, right, we, we, we send them into the FIFO. They have to sit down. The operating system, the, the, the P threads API, the Windows API, they handle the serialization, they put threads to sleep in a defined order and wake them up in the same order. So that's, that's how it works. That's QMutex. The only thing I haven't shown is the platform-specific code and the implementation of TriLock. That's QMutex. That's what we use the Atomic API for, the reference counting and this. We have some possibilities in the future. QRead-WriteLock is one of the obvious ones. Today, we build this on top of QMutex and QWait condition, uh, mostly because read-write-lock is a very complex uh, type of primitive. We have to store not only the number of readers, but the number of writers. And at the moment, our atomic API can only operate on one value, not two. Most systems can, don't have support for writing two values in an atomic fashion. So at the moment, we have to use mutex to implement read-write-lock. There are ways to do it. They use busy wait, though. So uh, I'm going to see if I can get them to, to put them into the operating system queue. And in the future, I might be able to implement read write lock using the Atomic API. And uh, I was planning on maybe in the future using some lock free data structures, implementing list or stack without using a mutex that is thread safe using the Atomic API. Uh, I was thinking about using this to implement signals and slots. Not ever something I'd put into the public API, not until I knew it worked um, and could make it general enough, but at least we could use it for to speed up some of the things inside of Qt. Right. Like I said, that's what we use the Atomic API for at the moment. Next thing on the list, QObject. The, the interesting parts of QObject that I could come up with when I wrote the presentation. I'm sure there are more. We've got time for questions at the, at the end. Um, we're going to talk about QObject private. Right? We talked about Pimple previously. We're going to talk about the trick we do with QObject private. Uh, I'm going to talk about thread affinity. People from the threading talk we had just a second ago remember thread affinity. This is the idea that an object belongs to a thread, and that thread is responsible for delivering events uh, to and slots to that object. Of course, the signal is not next, and that's very interesting, but we're going to talk about that after Q object. That, that gets a whole section of its own. Right? So, Q object private. We all remember pimple, right? Q object private 
is actually uh, uh, actually inherits from something called QObject data. QObject data, right? Remember, we implement some functions inline. Here are some of them that we implement inline in QObject. So we have to have QObject data in the public header, private access, of course. Uh, and we inherit from that class to create QObject private. So in QObject, we have a single pointer, d underscore ptr. Not d, just d, it d underscore ptr. This is of the type QObject data star. This is a pointer to a QObject data. QObject private inherits from QObject data, which means um, whenever we want to get to QObject data, we have to cast. Right? Well, we don't want to have to like, type this cast all the time, so we have a function to do it for us. D underscore func. D func. I know it's late. Bear with me. Right? D func is the one that does the cast. Casts the QObject data up to a QObject private. Okay. So we type defunct all the time in our code. Well, no, that's not right. We actually have a macro to do this for us. We get to our lovely D pointer using a macro. We use a Q underscore D macro, give it the class name, and this declares a variable that's initialized to the return value of the defunct. Right? Q object set object name. This is the way, this is the implementation. It copies straight out of Q42. D underscore, Q underscore D, Q object, declares our lovely D pointer, and I set the name. So, I can hear the question brewing. Why all the trouble? Why do it this way? Isn't this overly complex? Yeah, it is, but it, get, it opens up a possibility for a lot of optimizations. Q, it, Q object is the base class of all of our public AP, uh, all of our public classes. Or not all of them, but many of them. Q widget, Q TCP socket, uh, uh, lots of others, right? In previous versions of Qt, each of those public classes would have a D pointer that they would have to allocate. So, for example, Q push button inherits from Q abstract button, that inherits from Q widget, and Q widget inherits from Q object. This means in Qt2 and in Qt3, when you create a Q push button, you're actually creating a Q push button, a Q push button private, a Q abstract button private, Q widget private, and Q object private. Yeah. So what we can do with this trick, we can inherit the privates as well. So now, whenever you create a Q push button, we create a Q push button private which inherits all the way down to Q object private, one constructor, one memory allocation, saves us time and space. So, and this is where the QD, Q defunct magic comes into place, right? I have one instance of the D, of the private data, and I simply upcast it to the proper type, depending on the implementation of the public class. I know if this is a Q push button, I know that my private is going to be at least a Q push button private. I can upcast to it, and I don't have any problems. That's why we do that. Right. The most derived class is the one that actually creates the private. Okay. Uh, what this means is the constructors that you call in your code are the ones that create the private. We internally, the, the, the constructor of Q push button will not call, will call uh, a constructor with this signature. It will pass a reference to the private data and uh, a pointer to the parent. The reason we use this signature, we pass it by reference, but we actually create the private on the heap. The reason we pass it like this is to disambiguate the constructor. Because if you do not have a parent, the compiler often doesn't know are you really did, did you call the constructor that takes a parent with the wrong type or did you call this one with no parent the compiler doesn't know so we pass the private by reference we create it on the heap and q object is the one that stores the pointer to that and deletes that when the q object is destroyed 
right? So all the Q classes, all the Q object subclasses use this constructor in all of their base classes. To, to what they call the constructor of their base class. Sorry. And then we use yet another macro to declare the private of the public classes that you guys use. Right? This is the one that defines that defunc and and spits out the code to do the cast for us. It's a neat trick. But uh, like I said, pimple, right? This is private implementation. We don't expose this mechanism to you, so it's not something that you can build on to try and get memory savings out of. <coughs> Sorry, this is so that we can add stuff to these classes as needed. But um, it's an interesting part. If you go reading the cute code, you're going to see defunct, QD, DPTR things, so there's, that's why we do it. The next thing in Q object that I wanted to talk about was thread affinity. How do we actually implement thread affinity? It's actually surprisingly simple, right? As I said, the thread affinity, that's the idea that an object belongs to a thread. We use this in the single slot mechanism. I'll show you how that works uh, in a second. Uh, every Q object has a, a pointer to something called a Q thread data. This is what we in Q use as the real identity of a thread. Not the Q thread, but the Q thread data. This is the one where we put all the stuff that we want to have per thread. Like I said, Q object private holds a reference to a Q thread data, and the Q thread data is the one that then has the reference to the Q thread that you guys subclass and use. Q thread data. Like I said, it only holds the per thread data, the post event list, the thread local storage. Right? You guys remember Q thread storage from my previous presentation. Q thread storage is the thread local storage. You can set a pointer uh, per thread. When the thread exits, we go through the thread data and clean that data up for you. We also put the event dispatcher. This is the, the class that is responsible for doing all the event dispatching for that thread. This is what Q event loop and Q thread exec build on top of. And of course, like I said, it has a pointer to the Q thread that it represents. So to implement thread affinity, we have this. Q object colon colon thread is a const function. Q underscore D, there's my D pointer, and I simply return the thread out of the thread data. That's thread affinity. It can be changed. We have to do lots of little things to, to, to change the thread affinity. Mostly, it's just changing the, the, we don't change the thread pointer. We change the pointer to the thread data. And of course, when we do that, we pull all of the posted events and timers and socket notifiers and all of these things out and place them into the new thread. We actually do this built on top of the post event mechanism. Right. Right. The real reason we all came here. Right. How do we do signals and slots? Right. We use the thread affinity in Qt4 to add the thread support to signals and slots. So let's do it. That's why we're all here. Right. Connections in Q. Whenever you call Q object connect to connect a signal to a slot, what we do is we create a, a small struct to represent that con uh, that connection. That uh, that struct contains a pointer to the sender and the receiver, and it stores a number that represents the signal and the slot for from for the sender and receiver. We also store the connection type and uh, some information about how we actually marshal or actually make copies of the arguments to the slot in case we need to make a copy because we're doing, uh, uh, we're calling a slot for an object in another thread. We're posting an event and copying the objects for that thread. We store all that information in this, in this Q connection class. The symbols and slots, they're, they're represented by numbers. We don't store them by, by name. It using using a string, we store them using a, a number. This is something we get from QMeta object. Mock is the one that decides this number based on the order that you define your slots in in your class. So this means we can do very fast comparisons when we decide now it's time to call a slot. I'm emitting a signal. So when we do that, we look. We all these connections are stored in in one global list. We use read write lock to allow concurrent read-only access to the list 
can write lock only when we're modifying the list, adding a new connection or removing a connection. We index using multi-hash on the sender and receiver to the various connections in this list. This gives us the ability to very quickly find out for this sender, these connections are, are have, or these objects have been connected to that sender. Or for this receiver, it will receive signals from any of these number of senders. Gives us the ability to very quickly delete an object, for example. When we delete an object, we need to go in and break all the connections to that object, both from if it's going to receive things or if it's going to send things, we need to break those connections. That's why we do it like this. The signal emission itself is done by a function called QMetaObjectActivate. This is a function that we've implemented in QObject.cpp. It's in the core lib in this kernel subdirectory if you want to take a look at it. I haven't shown the code for it because it is quite a long function. There's lots of things that we have to do. We support quite a number of things uh, in MetaObjectActivate. Among other things, you can delete the sender that is sending a signal from a slot. And QMetaObject object activate has code in there to protect against that. So it's a lot of code. I'm not going to show it here, but uh, if you're interested, go, go give it a read. It's, it's, it's uh, pretty ingenious, I think. But then again, I'm biased. So um, QMetaObject object activate is um, just has a couple of, a couple of function arguments: the sender, uh, and then this 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 number to represent your signal. Right? It can actually have a, a range of signals. I can emit multiple signals at the same time. Uh, I'll actually show you an example of this, how we do that. And then uh, we pass the arguments that we want to that we want to give to the slot. We send all that through Kubernetes object activate. Right. I'm going to show you an example of the mock generated code. It took Q abstract button and clicked. This is a a slot, I'm sorry, a signal that has a single argument with a default value. Right, bool checked it was false. What mock does is in the meta object when we introspect and look at a Q abstract button, think like a Q push button or a checkbox or a radio button, we will see that the meta object says there are two signals called clicked. One with no arguments, one with an argument. This is how we represent this in the meta object. The code that mock generates generates just one function. It doesn't generate two, right? We can only generate one function. This is the function that's called whenever you call emit. Emit is actually a defined. It's defined to nothing. You simply call this function, pass in the argument. What we do is we build up the argument list that we're going to send to QMeta object activate. We send pointers to the arguments. Uh, this is mock generated code. I've formatted it and added some comments because normally the mock generated code is not human readable. So I've added the comments to kind of explain what's going on. The first value in this argument list, this argument array that we're building is reserved, reserved for a return value. This is so that in the future uh, we can add support for return values to slots. Apparently we already support it today, we just don't document it because it doesn't work in all cases. But we do use that to implement the property mechanism. So that's why it's there. That's why it's reserved for, you know, for doing things in the future. So arguments always start at the second place in the array. We take that. We pass it off to QMeta object activate. Pass in the sender, the meta object, right, the information about this particular object. We pass that into QMeta object activate because we need it. And then we pass a range of signals, right? This, this is an overloaded signal. It's actually two signals instead of just one. So we're saying activate anything that is connected to either clicked or clicked with a bool argument. This is so that um, uh, depending on your needs, you can connect to, to this signal with a slot that has no arguments or a slot that has a bool argument, just like you would expect. Pass in two and three, and then the, the arguments. That's when QMeta object activate takes over, starts doing its job. Uh, first thing it does is takes the sender, looks that up in that connection list that we were talking about, right? We find all the connections for that sender, 
and we go through and start looking at them, which of those connections are actually connected to either signal two or three, right? We store numbers in the connect connection, right? So we go through them and we simply, we start activating, right? We call this activation. We activate those slots. We do this by um, doing a couple of things first, right? We have this connection type, three types. Well, it's actually two and one automatic to pick one of the two. The default is auto. It checks if the current thread, the receiver thread, and the sender thread are all the same. If they are, we will use the direct type. If not, we're going to use the queued type. The direct type is like how we have in queue three. It calls the slot immediately. It's just like a function call. The queued type posts an event, S sends an event, uh, posts an event to the receiver. The receiver will get that event after control returns to the event loop. Right. So we either we, we decide a queued or direct. We're going to at some point call your slot. How do we get to your slot? How do we get to your implementation from QMet object activate? We use a virtual function call. We have a, func uh, a virtual function in Q object called Q meta call. This is something that is defined and re-implemented every time you use the Q object macro. This is something mock generates. Q object activate, uh, Q meta object activate, sorry, calls Q meta call with, um, the, with the arguments that we are, with the, the number of the slot we want to call and the arguments that we were passed from the sender. I'm going to show you how this works. We'll take a look at um, Q line edit set text. I've alighted a few things above and below this because the, this particular function is quite large. We use Q meta call to implement the property system as well. So I've removed that from the top and I've not shown all the other slots because I didn't have the space, right? I had to make this big enough so everybody could see it. But effectively what happens, we call Qt meta call, this will call your, uh, the re-implementation in Qt line edit of Qt meta call. We go through, this happens to be an invoke call. This is not a property call. That's what the first argument of, of the meta call says. What, what are we trying to do? If we're setting a property, this will not be invoke method, it'll be something else. But in our case, it is invoke method. We can go in here and do a switch. We'll switch on that number that represents our slot and call set text by doing lots of nasty casts from the pointer back to the type that we got from, from, the, from the sender. Right. This code is executed either by the direct connection, by the direct function call, or when we receive the event. We all go through the same function. An interesting side effect, this is something that Matthias also mentioned uh, in, in his keynote. An interesting side effect of this approach is that because Q meta call is re-implemented by the Q object macro, mock generates this code, if you declare a slot in your subclass that happens to be the same name and the same signature as a slot in one of your base classes, the slot effectively becomes virtual without you having to declare it as virtual. Because we find the most derived meta object when we do the activation. So um, it, gives us the, it gives us quite a bit of possibilities for, for, for adding new virtual functions without breaking binary compatibility. We've actually done this already in, in Qt. Qt style, in Qt 4.1 we added standard icon implementation, which gives us the possibility of, in QStyle subclasses, of re-implementing standard icon, which is not a virtual function. It's just a, a function that calls this slot re-implementation. A neat trick, but as Matthias mentioned, it's a bit, it's a bit unclean because it kind of breaks the virtual, non-virtual design, right? So. We did get to learn something, right? And if you do that and you don't want it, uh, yeah, it can come and shoot you. It can shoot you in the foot. So that's how we implement signals and slots. Like I said, I didn't show the code for 
a lot of how we do the activation, uh, mostly because it's it's uh, I didn't have the space here, but everybody has access to the source code. You can go and read it. It's pretty pretty interesting. I have ideas on how we can improve things instead of using a global list, maybe using lock free lists per object to store signal and slot connections. I don't know if that will work or not, but um, uh, that's how it works. That's how, uh, if you remove the queued activation things, that's how it worked in Qt3, right? Qt3 always did the direct call into Qt Medical. It never did the post event. This is something we added to Qt4. So, and then the fun part, compiler support, right? C++. Um, we mostly use GCC at Trolltech. It's uh, it's actually a pretty decent compiler. It supports most of the C++ standard. I would dare say all of the C++ standard. Recent versions, of course. If you use some of the older versions, uh, they, they may or may not accept so, some code. It has lots of nice of extensions to the C++ language. We actually uh, take advantage of some of these. Um, the type of operator, or the type of built-in, is kind of nice. You can use type of and any variable, and it will expand to the name of the type of that variable. So it allows you to declare a new variable of any type, for example, in, in a template function, or in a macro, even better. This is how we implement for each. For each is simply a macro that uses type of to declare a new variable so that we can, in, uh, we can iterate through a container. The Intel compiler for Linux, we, uh, I use that quite a bit myself, actually. Um, it supports many of the same GCC extensions. It actually masquerades as GCC, believe it or not. Right? GCC defines macros that, that say the version number and, and these types of things. The Intel compiler does the exact same thing. It masquerades as the GCC version you happen to have installed on your machine. Because they're binary compatible with GCC. You can take code with the compiled with the Intel compiler and the GCC compiler and mix them. It works just fine. They all implement the same version of the, the C++ ABI standard that is emerging on Linux. The Microsoft Visual Studio compilers are also very complete from 2003 and up. .NET 2002 and the Microsoft Visual Studio 6 compilers um, don't support everything. .NET 2002 is missing partial template specialization support. If you try to use any partial template specialization in your code, .NET 2002 will actually produce an error. Visual Studio 6 got a slide about Visual Studio 6. So but, uh, we'll talk about these for a second. Like I said, .NET 2003 and up, they're very good. They're, they're, they support the, the C++ standard. We've not had problems with partial template specialization, full specialization, function overloads of template functions. We, we don't have a whole lot of problems with these compilers. They optimize very well, and they tend to work. Yeah, okay, they don't have a lot of the nice extensions that GCC does, so we have to do things like for each using templates instead of simple macros. But hey, that's just the way it is. Right. Right, okay, so these, these are the compilers, we, those are the compilers we tend to use most of the time in, uh, uh, at, at Trolltech. But of course, we support other compilers. Um, they're not always as good as the ones we just saw, right? Um, so we have the party crashers. This has actually been censored and replaced because I put something in my presentation that uh, apparently they didn't like. So this is the politically correct uh, term. So we're gonna, I'll, I'm going to tell you about some of the pains we've had with Visual Studio 6, with the boring compiler, and with some of the Unix the commercial Unix compilers, some of the less well-known compilers. Visual Studio 6 is kind of interesting. We still support it, but it actually implements a draft of the C++ standard. If you go and look on Microsoft and Microsoft's website, Visual Studio 6 was released on September 1st of 1998. I think I mentioned this before in one of my previous presentations as well. The C++ standard 
was released on September 2nd, 1998, the day after. I don't think that uh, they had the time to, to fix or to, uh, to, to fix some of the discrepancies between the draft that they had implemented and and the, the final standard that was released the day after. So, um, so things like for scoping are 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 different in Visual Studio 6. If you use a construct like this where you define a variable in the for loop and use it outside of the loop. GCC doesn't like that. That's not part of the CSS Plus standard, but you can do that with Visual Studio 6. Okay, that's not too bad, right? We can fix those types of things. Uh, uh, and also, too, template functions. If you have a template function, the draft said that you had to have a function argument list that matched the template argument list. So any, anything that you had as a template argument had to appear in the function argument list. You can add add other things, but they, all of them had to be present in the functional argument list. Um, that's fine. We can work around those types of things. We do it in Qt. We tend to add temp, uh, template pointer arguments with a default value of zero so that we can get something that looks like a template function without having to actually put uh, uh, something into the argument list that we don't really need. So yeah, that, that, that's the dude, right? That's salt. What about some of the other stuff that we found out about Visual Studio 6? Well, like .NET 2002, it does not support partial template specialization. There's one, well, I'm not going to say small difference. There's one major difference. Um, it doesn't tell you this. You have to go read some knowledge base article or some form somewhere where uh, one of the Microsoft engineers says Visual Studio 6 does not support partial template specialization. If you write code using partial template specialization, Visual Studio 6 will accept it. It will compile it. No warnings, no errors. But I can see several smiles, right? It never picks the specialization. Never, ever, ever, never. It always uses the original non-specialized template declaration. If you try to specialize, it does not work. This caused us a lot of pain. We had implemented uh, some nice, we had, had tried to implement some nice auto-delete features based on, uh, based on partial template specialization. We were thinking maybe we could add a set auto-delete to true on a list full of pointers. And when you deleted the list, all the pointers would be deleted for you. But if you were storing values, if you were storing ints or string, Q strings, not pointers, just Q strings, we wouldn't have to do the auto-delete. We could have d decided, using a little bit of metaprogramming, some partial specialization, we could have decided for pointers we want to delete when we remove things from the list. For, re for everything else, we don't. Couldn't do it. Had, had to remove it. We implemented all that. We're trying it out. Spent weeks, weeks, trying to figure out why it didn't work with the Visual Studio 6 compiler. The code compiled just fine, but memory was leaking all over the place. There's why. Speaking of templates, let's talk about the Borland compiler. We used to support the Borland compiler in Qt3. Then we started doing a little more, uh, a little more metaprogramming. We implemented something called Qtype info. Qtype info gives us information about whether or not a particular type is a pointer or not. We managed to fix that with the Microsoft compiler, 6.0 included. If anybody's interested, I can show you how we did it. The Borland compiler, though, has, has, is not supported by Qt4. We could not make it work. Um, it had problems not only with the partial specialization, but with the full specialization that we used to, with the Microsoft compiler. It just didn't like it. Function overloads. If you try to overload a template function with a normal function overload, this is one of the things we wanted to do with Qmin and Qmax. And Qbound give me the minimum maximum uh, of two values. Or take a value and make sure it's within a certain range. We wanted to add overloads so that we could get the minimum and maximum value of, say, an int and a short. This is something people want to do all the time. They don't want to have to cast the short to an int just so the compiler picks the right template, right? The Borland didn't like it. We couldn't do it. 
we actually don't do it anymore because we had removed that code in hopes of getting the Boulder compiler to work. But because of the full template specialization uh, problem and the fact that it always picks template functions and never overloads, presented the problem. We, we never could get it to work. It didn't implement the C++ standard the way that the, all the other compilers did. So we don't support the Boulder compiler anymore. Some of, the, some of the commercial Unix compilers that we support, they're usually pretty good. Uh, the older versions are, we have some of the similar pains that we had with, with Visual Studio 6. They implemented a draft standard, so things like the for scoping were wrong, and template functions had to have arguments that matched the template argument list. That was all solvable. We didn't really, uh, we didn't start, didn't run into the problems with the partial template specialization because we tend to try Visual Studio 6 before we ever go to the commercial Unix compiler, so we saved ourselves a lot of pain there, I think. Um, but of course, it, all software has bugs, and these, these compilers, like I said, they, they're usually very good. They implement the C++ standard. They, they do things the way you would expect, but um, sometimes you run into bugs, and the optimizer bugs are the worst because while you're writing your program, you're debugging it, making sure everything works on Solaris or, or, or on HP, right? You're debugging your code, you're not using optimization, everything works fine. Press the release buttons, you know, we're, we're, we're done. Well, the final release, the optimized build breaks because the optimizer had some sort of bug in it. Um, earlier this year, I, uh, I was helping uh, one of my colleagues debug a problem with the HP compiler, one of the older HP compilers was having a problem with temporaries we were creating in a question colon operator statement. The temporaries, we had uh, two temporaries, or I'm sorry, three temporaries, one in the condition and uh, one in each of the, uh, of the conditional, right? The, the we, so we could have created three temporaries, you know, we, uh, we had created, used three temporaries in the code but at execution time, you only ever ex uh, create two of them. But that compiler would destroy three of them. So it would actually destroy one of the temporaries twice. Yeah, gotta love that. And then the best part is when you upgrade to a new release of a particular compiler and the compiler itself breaks. We did this, um, I'm not going to name names, that's wrong. Uh, I've already talked about Borland and MSVC the Eric Smith Pro compiler, we upgraded to the latest release, supposedly a bug fix release. And um, the compiler asserts trying to compile QMake. So um, yeah, I don't know how to fix that one. So uh, sometimes, yeah. These are some of the pains that we go through. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about was the Sun compiler. The Sun compiler is extremely strict about private access. If you define uh, structs and nested classes in private access, the Sun compiler is very picky. Uh, you have to have lots of friends for those things to work. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of times you run into problems that it won't let you forward declare that private class to declare it and make it a friend. So. We had originally wanted to implement pimple, key object private, and these types of mechanisms using nested classes. Couldn't do it, we had to have them separate. So, yeah. That was not so bad, we still support the Sun compiler and it tends to work fairly well. It's actually a very decent optimizing compiler on the Spark as well. I've had, I've seen cases where the code can get uh, sometimes 10, 10 or 11 times, 15 times faster for some, some small tight loops. That's all that I had. Um, I know in the abstract I mentioned I was going to talk about the event system, but um, I gave three presentations. I didn't have time to fill in the information here. We talked a little bit about it in the previous presentation, but if anybody has any questions about that or anything else, now's the time. I think we have. 